Namaste and in La Catch, and welcome to this episode of One World in a New World. I'm your host, Zen Benefiel, and this week's guest is Robin Johnson. She is a really wonderful character in the cosmic scene of play that we have. She's executive director of ETA to Oneness Institute. Very interesting name. She's the author of Ego on Front Street. ETA to Oneness, A Journey to Spiritual Awakening, and Awakening of a Chocolate Mystic. That's mm -hmm. got to be an interesting story, mm -hmm. fellow chocoholic. Mm -hmm. She is a graduate of Clark Atlanta University, of Schiller Inst International University, and uh, having a Master of Arts in International Relations and Affairs, and also a degree in Communication and Media Studies. Mm -hmm. Robin? Such a pleasure to have you here. It's a pleasure to join you, Zen. So, about our inner sight, right? This is kind of the focus that, not kind of, it is the focus of all of the podcasts I've been doing and investigating and exploring and inviting others to engage in their own inner awareness and its development and how that affects our outer lives. So, in your, with, with the, the wonderful expression you've had in life and the roads you've been down, the books you've written, the institutes that you started and the work that you do, how did that all start? Where, when did you first get in touch with that inner part of you that at the time, probably most everybody else seemed like they were unaware of? <laughs> I think not only me, but all of us come in with a purpose. And our life just unfolds until we become aware of the purpose. Mm. For me... That's a great synopsis. Yeah. So, so for me, the purpose I came in with that I was not aware of was harmony, mm. oneness, getting along with one another. And because I was an early product of divorce... By age three, that also left me open to abuses, physical, sexual, um, emotional, and eventually financial, all because people were not able to get along. And so I, I, that, that sent me on a lifelong quest. Mm. How do we do this? There has to be a way for us to get along better with one another. And what is, getting in, what is getting in the way? Right. And we've got that phrase that we're all familiar with. Can't we all just get, get along? along. And, just, and we just give a lip service. We don't do it, it you know. Yeah. So, so that sent me on, that sent me on a mission, Zen. It sent me on a mission to find out why can we not do this? We're programmed for it. We're programmed to communicate, to connect, to be engaged with one another. But yet all we do is that results in a lot of chaos and conflict when we can't get our way. So sure. what does that mean? And wh why do we function like that? Do you think so, the programming comes from outer positioning or, or outer information that we're like these emotional intellectual sponges trying to gather up everything from outside of us because we haven't really explored the inside? And is that programming you're speaking of more a, a synergy of genetic and, for lack of a better, solar, S-O-U-L, energy? I think it's a combination. First of all, I don't believe most of us realize we've been programmed. Mm. And the programming is not even who we are. We are so much more than the conditioning that we have been told we are. Which, hence, the all of the displays of conditional love yes if you love me then you will hurt yourself to serve me <laughs> that makes a lot of sense doesn't that's it? how we're programmed but where in nature is that true that's what i started hearing from my own inner voice in the world that's created in nature, where is it written that one tree must grow and the others must wait until that tree has decided it's lived its life and now I'll allow the next tree or the next blade of grass or the next flower or the next leaf? 
Only man does that. Man operates from this place of lack and limitation and, and you must wait because there's not enough. And I am not the only one who grew up in an environment of that feeling of lack and limitation and there's not enough and whatever you get, you give away everything, hoping somebody will do the same for you. Well, we just had a global event that promoted the scarcity. Yeah. Yes. Could we wake up? You know, did we get that memo? I think a lot of us did because one of the things that happened as a result of the pandemic is it forced people out of the hamster wheel and into complete stop mode. And in that stop mode, a lot of people were beginning to finally say, I didn't like my life anyway. I never liked that job. I don't like my wife. I hate my kids. I don't like my friends. I don't even, I don't even like the city I'm living in. All kinds of emotions came up for people because in our way of being, we have been able to distract ourselves with activity. Right. right. Because we don't know who we are. We're seeking what is normal and natural for us, which is a feeling of joy, a feeling of love, a feeling of harmony. That's a natural inclination. But the way we've been programmed or conditioned to go after that is what has been problematic for mm -hmm. me. And I'm sure for others, the problem is it's outside that brings the satisfaction and nothing could be further from the truth. Right. And, and as you're saying, you know, we're programmed to have the stuff and that's what'll make us happy. And, <laughs> and yet we tend to be argumentative with the things that we don't like and focus on those how do we shift that to focusing on what we do appreciate desire need for our own love and harmony to expand wow i uh how about i give you a quick story of mine i'd love to hear I, it i did what people said to do that will make you happy. So I pursued running my own business. I was a management consultant with the federal government for 20 years. I was at towards the end of that career generating a lot of money. So I was flying around the world first class, staying in first class hotels, buying anything I want. I had my BMW shipped in from Germany. I had my little suburban house in Philadelphia. I was dating this guy who was a Harvard educated attorney. And I came home from a business trip one day, fell on the bed and said, God, you are not in any of what I'm doing. I have everything people say you should have, and I am miserable. And the message I got in that moment was, then let it go. Don't renew your contract. At this point, for, for about a year, I was billing the government $70,000 per month. I was keeping in my pocket about $25,000 per month to do whatever I wanted. And when I heard that, just walk away, I said, okay, all cavalier, okay. <laughs> and I fell from the top of the mountain down to the valley, crossed the valley over to the shoreline, down the shore into the bottom of the ocean. And I'm like, oh my God, who would want to follow a divine guidance that says, do it like that? But what I got out of all of that was a disconnection from TANFITS, the tangible physical reality, mm -hmm. that need to control everything and anything around me. Because once I lost control of my finances, I lost control of my life. Sure. And it forced a whole new realignment of what was important. And now, have you ever heard the phrase uh, that we live half inside and half outside? What you're saying illustrates that point. Yeah. Exclusively. So, so in the rebuilding, I never, ever got back to that place where I believed that money was the solution. I never got back to the place where I believed everybody needs to be a certain way. That's the solution. What I came back with from the loss of everything is that I lost nothing. 
in the losing of everything. Mm. And therein lies freedom. What I found was that the true essence of who I am, it's more like steam or smoke. It's untouchable. It's unassailable. It's invulnerable. So it doesn't matter what happens in the outer. That can't alter who I am. And that's what I get to come back with. So I trade it and I do it all again to come back with that understanding. And what I'm hoping to help other people understand is you don't have to have the loss of everything to have a shift in your priorities. You are already everything. Nothing that's happening externally to you is altering the essence of who you were created to be. Mm -hmm. So bring the essence of yourself to the physical world. And let's see what kind of world we now get. When you don't have to control what everybody else is doing or taking from everybody else or shutting everybody else down or limiting everybody else because that's somehow impacting you. When you realize that none of that is true and you're not impacted or limited by what someone else is doing because you always have information that flows through you that can adjust any situation you find yourself in. Absolutely. And it's such a joy to have this kind of conversation with one who is on the same page. Mm -hmm. You know, you and I both have had that awareness that our mission here is to help facilitate a new world order of harmony among people and planet, right? You got it very young. I got it at 18 in a, in a really demonstrable way, prayed to know what truth was, and I was willing to die for it. Mm -hmm. Well, how often do we do that? You know, we get to that place like you did, where it was all, you, you finally said, enough. Enough. What do, what do I am? Who am I? And what Who am I, what Who am I, I beyond do? the stuff? Who am I beyond the stuff? And many of us are now getting to the point where, where we don't have a choice but to go find that out. Go find the answer to that question. Who am I beyond my stuff? Who mm -hmm. am I beyond this definition of who I am? Now, do you think that also, not just being a little scary for folks, it also kind of indicates that, oh, well, maybe I've got to jettison all, you know, everything in my life and, and things like that. Do you find that in this process with appropriate questions mm -hmm. that there's more of a flow and the adjustments are incremental rather than a foul swoop? It depends on the person. And it depends on their commitment to the process. Um, for me, I had to lose everything because part of what was guiding me was what I called my spiritualized ego. Mm -hmm. I can do that. You want to be spiritual? I can do that. That's kind of how my ego functioned. So part yeah. of what was lost was because of my arrogance. A lot of people don't who are spiritual don't even see their arrogance at play. And right. I did not see mine. <laughs> well, you know, this brings up a great point <clears throat> we were talking about earlier. In this understanding of arrogance, once we find this new nugget and we start engaging it, we, as we do things anywhere, we do things everywhere. So that habit pattern, whatever you want to call it, is still present. And that arrogance then turns into, oh, I found this. I got to shove it up everybody's. Yeah. Right. Or, and, and I or was that. I was absolutely that. Um, you know, harmony. We can do this. All you have to do is, mm. it, is it, acknowledge me and accept me and allow me to be who I want to be. And and all of the talk we give to that. But to me, I finally came to the realization. I have very strong um, family members, mothers and sisters. The female energy in my house household, uh, uh, the original household, very, very strong women. So mm -hmm. whenever I would start that, the answers would come back. Who made you right? Why do I have to change? So you're okay. You know, lots of those good probing questions. And so what I finally realized was it's not about them. It's really about me and how I'm seeing my own reality. Sure. Why do I need people to be a certain way for me to be okay? Well, actually I don't. But then if I'm not, I have to make allowances for the other person to not be okay. 
and which is what I would not do. I was always someone in pursuit of harmony, trying to make sure and ensure that everybody was always happy. And what I finally realized was that I'm pursuing harmony from the angle of peace, total absence of conflict. Right. But now I pursue harmony from the perspective of oneness. And oneness is about the acceptance of the differences. We need to make room for people to be who they are without trying to make everybody the same. We're all different puzzle pieces, but we can really fit together. We can harmonize. We're designed to fit together. We're, designed what we're talking to be, about. We're not designed to be the same piece though. And that's the problem that we're having. That's why there's, I think, so much conflict, especially in the West. There is, there is a push right now to homogenize everybody, to make everybody the same, to make everybody do the same thing and be the same way. And there is a real pushback from people who, who say, you cannot change my identity. I am who I am. And I need to contribute as the person that I am. Mm -hmm. And we need to make allowances for that. We can't set up rules and structures that keep people from being all of who they're meant to be. Because That's that is a recipe for continued conflict. And as we, uh, great points that, that you made. And, and as we continue this effort of pushing and pulling energy that we may not be aware that we're doing, <laughs> right? Until we become aware. And it's like, oh, wait a minute. What about flow? You know, there was a great book called Flow, The Psychology of Optimal Experience, Ooh, hey. right? That's been around for a couple of decades. And the author, Michaeli uh, Csikszentmihalyi, was given the award of Thinker of the Year, I think in 2000 or something like that. What I find that, that is just almost unimaginable is that there are a few people who go back and look through history to the point, for instance, uh, Dr. Laszlo, right? He keys in on the Vedantic philosophy well this comes from the vedas and the rig vedas mm -hmm. where were they how old are they well they're 10 to fifteen thousand years old yeah. right and they had this concept they presented the concept of unitive consciousness and that we're all divine threads of that incarnate and we be and we can become god incarnate so that's, that's who we are really, no, that's, that's who we that's who we are. We exactly. don't even have, that's who we are. When we get rid of our ego that is dominating everything, that's all that's left. That level of consciousness, that level of connectivity, that level of, of steam or smoke, that's all that's left. Mm -hmm. So the flow that people are looking to get into, to stay in, comes automatically through that process. Totally I mean, agree. Let me give you an example. I just did a road trip with my sisters and one sister ended up with a concussion and the other sister fell. So during the road trip, I ended up having to do all of the highway driving for about four days. I hate highway driving mm. like with a passion, but I would get into the wheel and I'd say, okay, spirit, you know, I hate driving. So you drive. And then I would sit back, close my eyes for a second, take a couple of deep breaths. And I'd, I'd ask, are you ready? And I'd hear yes. And then I'd start to drive. And everywhere I went, I felt like I was in the passenger seat. I got every place I needed to go, jumping three and four lanes of traffic to get on or off. Knowing I hate highway driving, all I felt was calm. Everybody has this flowing through them. But we're not using it. We're not accessing it because we are spending our time through our outer vision trying to control the external instead of being one with that unity consciousness, that God source, that, that fundamental essence of who we really are and letting that come through us. Mm -hmm. I, I attempt to example that even in my pronoun selection. I okay. am, we are. Yes. You know, that's really where it is. And until, and we, once I am, then I can participate in we are. 
because that's where it naturally goes in that understanding of that thread that is part of the tapestry. But then we get stuck. We get stuck in the I am, and we believe I am. I am God, and I yeah. can do what I want, and I'm going to tell you how it needs to be. We are stuck. <laughs> that's why I wrote Ego on Front Street. I was stuck, big, stuck, because I thought I knew. And I'm telling you, the more uh, spiritually awake you become, the more susceptible you can be to the early um, awakening phases that that can fill yourself with your own ego and your own arrogance, and that becomes another hurdle to co to go through. Mm -hmm. And if we can help people um, understand who they are and what they are, and it's not about the individual. We're just vessels for this consciousness coming through. If we can begin to pull back on who I am and what I am and what I do, it's not even about me. It's, it's the vessel that people are seeing. I'm not even a person. I'm just like, I'm just like a little puzzle piece. Right. And I don't, you know, so we can help people with that understanding that we are so much more than what we're allowing ourselves to be then we are so much more than the I that has been conditioned and created and the expectations we're trying to meet. We are so much more than all of that. Mm -hmm. And then the funny thing is our ability to, to manifest and connect comes easier when we withdraw that sense of I and ego. Sure, sure. Now, living above the shoulders, which is what we most do, <laughs> right? We're looking for evidence. Oh, for sure. How do for we sure. find that? What kind of evidence has have you noticed or begin began to notice from an intellectual place before you integrated it into your body, or was it in reverse? You know, because the indigenous philosophy is a three brain, the gut, the heart, and the head, and, and you start by connecting with the the vibrations, which we now know from quantum physics, everything is. Yes. And then you process upward, the, you know, okay. find the resonance and then, okay, how do I handle this? That's the choices, the free will that we're given in our selection of choices as to what to do. So did you find that there was a mix between, you know, figuring out, oh, I'm not just living above my shoulders. I actually have a body to work with <laughs> and kind of like um, there, there's a really great uh, short video um, I can't remember the guy's name that, about it, but it's illustrating the 369 numbers that Tesla uh, identified. And also there's a little snippet in it that speaks to this point of light that's at the center of our being that has all of this energy that mm. kind of like a horned Taurus mm. that flows around us in multiple directions all the time. And it is that place from what, they are explaining and what I've experienced and I believe what you've experienced too is that's where you let go that's the driving force of being in the physical body and <laughs> being able to access that um, divine mission you were talking about that purpose that perfected form fit and function in the world yeah how does this Again, back to that question, how do you find the, the balance between the intellectualization, the emotionalization, and the spirituality involved in the uh, seeking the flow or finding the flow or, or even just becoming aware that it's already there once you let go of the bias? Yeah. Well, those are really great questions and great insights. Um, for me personally, I spent as I said, a lot of time in, in search for this gateway to harmony. There must be a way to get along. That led me to study. So for at the beginning of the new millennium, the year 2000, I was awakened with uh, a kind of a mystical experience. I was talking to a guy and he says, are you ready? Are you going to help? And I'm like, yeah, if I said I'm going to help, I'm going to help. And it turns out that the guy talking to me said his name was Francis. And I'm like, what does that mean? He says, Francis of Azizi. So I'm, you know, I woke up, jumped up. Francis of Assisi, and I'm not Catholic, so I had to do a whole bunch of study. Mm. To make a long story short, every year at the beginning of the new millennium, I picked up a new religion. I'm trying to find intellectually 
how do we live this stuff? How do we live the spiritual concepts that we are all somehow infused with either through church or through the cultures that, in which we live? Which and they all have the same, to have the same core of yeah, we, right. the essence so, of loving and being loved. Right. So, so I, I did that. But what happened was after seven years of that, I was no closer to living any of that stuff. But you and had then, complete cellular exchange. I had, a, I, I was living above, <laughs> I was living, living above the shoulders. I understood it intellectually, but what I was right. not willing to do was engage my heart because my heart was full of pain, pain from abuse, sexual abuse, physical abuse, financial abuse. My heart was full of pain. So I'm trying to make my life what it needs to be without engaging the driver of life, which is your heart. Mm -hmm. Now, now you find me, in, in engaging that, I, I apologize for the interruption, but there's a, a, a poignant or a um, pregnant question there. And, and that is, how did you engage that? Okay. So for me, I was home one day watching television and I saw this lady come on. She was a life coach on the New York Times bestseller. Her name was Debbie Ford. And she mm -hmm. said, the longest journey you will ever take is the one from your head to your heart. And many of you are living in your head and you're not accessing your heart. So it's like putting ice cream on top of poop. Mm. <laughs> and I love it. So I got her book and, and then eventually I met her. And eventually I became one of her coaches, trained and certified under her. Awesome. And, wh and what I found out was that what I was most trying to do, you can't do it strictly above the shoulders. You cannot live life strictly from an intellectual place. Life is not an intellectual experience. Hmm. Life is to be lived and to be lived is from the heart space and the heart experiences all kinds of emotions. And what all of us need to be about, which is what I had to spend time doing, is we need to get in and dig out and up and out a lot of negative, hurtful, harmful, emotions need to be released. They need to be released with those people that created them. They need to be released in journaling, writing, um, speaking to others. They need to be released because what's happening is that we are all full. We, we, we are emotionally just saturated. And any little thing that now happens that we have a reaction to, everything up under that is coming out. It's disproportionate to the situations at hand. And, uh, and part of the spiritual awakening, I believe, is a lot of this is coming out of people so that they now have more room for the spirit within to operate. Mm -hmm. Now, from the science, I know you're a, you're a part-time science geek, like, like I'm a part-time science geek. They now know from the Heart Math Institute, there are at least 40,000 neurons in the heart. Neurons are the same kind of neurons that are in the brain and the neurons can make decisions. And once you can clear your heart of all, a lot of the pain that you have, you will find that you make really quick, instant decisions. And then you spend the rest of your time trying to talk yourself out of that. <laughs> second guessing, right? It's second, like you begin with the intellectualization. That second guessing is in the, in the intellectual, it's in the head space. It's not right. in the heart space. Your heart knows. If I were to tell anybody anything that could help them in this lifetime, follow your heart, follow what you feel. There's a reason why you're being given that information, even though it looks like it's not the right information. Well, and it's it in talk. the present moment too, right? right? It, it, in your head, you're generally in the past or future. Absolutely. And, and you have no clue about what's happening in the present. Well, the, the body, the heart is an instrument. We just don't know how to tune it. And yet we try to think our way through a system built on vibration instead of sensing our way through it. That well, well, we don't want to feel it. We can't feel it because there's so many other emotions in there. And what happens if they come out? Now it's going to alter how people see me. Because now I may be mad and angry and aggressive or selfish or inconsiderate or because that's not what I want. And I don't want to have that image. Now comes the conflict between mm. that conditioning and the expectations and who I really am. Mm. 
if you're willing to allow yourself to let that clash, then who you really are is closer to some of that conditioning, but without the self-sacrifice. Right. It's who authentic. Really are, it's an authentic it's, response. It's, an authentic. it's not a denial. No. Everything, what is, is. We can't deny right. What's going on inside of us? However, we can learn to embrace it, which then transforms it. Absolutely, we've we've got to, we've got to own our contribution to the chaos. We've got to stop mm -hmm. blaming everybody else. Uh, we, we've got to be willing to feel the pain of what was done to us as victims and what we've done to others. Yeah, we've I, I'm laughing to... because my dad had the uh, you know being orphaned and adopted. I, I was given a really magnificent chance at life and, and my parents last name Benefield means good fidelity so and I didn't realize that until much later in my life however one of the things that he used to say to me and you know, he was also a 32nd degree Knights Templar Mason mm -hmm. be careful pointing fingers you got yeah. three of them coming back at you absolutely absolutely that was emphasized a lot in our life coaching program Mm. For sure. And, and as long as we can deflect, we don't have to change anything about ourselves. Most of us don't want to change anything about ourselves. We just want the world to change to accommodate us. Right. And with that lightsaber, man, we can defend ourselves and deflect. and yeah, we're, we're good. I mean, we, can, we are so quick at doing so. We're awesome. We're, we're, we're amazing. I didn't know. I didn't realize how good I was at it. <laughs> at the same time, while, while I speak all of this spiritual awakening language. Right. We can speak the language and not live the philosophy. Sure. Yeah. And you can tell, at least it seems anyway. And when we have a, a little further development down the path, we can see the difference between and the resonance of just speaking the words and embodying the words that we speak. That there's a whole different, and this is available to others too. That's the level of sensory capacity that we have because of the energy exchange going on all the time. And depending on, at least from what I've discovered and, and how what I was taught was that, you know, in that place of now, our energy is huge. In the place of past and future, it's maybe six foot in diameter. Oh, nice. And it exponentiates in the present. Mm. So That's that means everybody well. can, you know, that sensation that's available of the perception of the I, M, exponentiates as opposed to being constricted. And then also in that constriction, bringing in all of those outside program fears that I've heard what at least 93% of them never manifest. Well, you know what? I mean, I, I love saying this and you know, I've heard you say it before on, on some of your shows, fear is an acronym, false evidence appearing real. We, we got that. But when you get, when you go into the fear, now, as a kid, I used to hate to have to put the garbage out because the maggots crawling in the garbage. And my mother would say, feel the fear and do it anyway. Yeah. That was probably one of the best things that I ever got. Feel the fear and do it anyway. If we do that and we move through the fear, what we find on the other side is that there is really nothing to fear. The fear mm -hmm. comes from the defense of the physical reality, but we're the ones creating the physical reality. Right. What are we afraid of? I mean, it's kind of a, it's kind of mind blowing. The essence of who we are, it's like steam is like smoke. We can never be, we can never not exist. Sure, we cannot exist in a physical body, but it doesn't mean we don't exist. Right. In consciousness, we continue to exist. Oh, if, always. My own experience is evident for me. And I staked my life on being able to experience it by dying, being willing to die for what I believed in. And that was cosmic consciousness. Okay. And so when I went into the light and then beyond it, surrounded by points of light, just like I was at the time. Then when I came back, I realized, oh, that 
point of light is in me, even here now. It's not just in that realm of consciousness. It is me. Whatever I may be was still in the discovery process and still is. All right. Well, you're, sure bringing up, you. you're bringing up another point. And I think as we move into this spiritual awakening time, we need to make room for people to own their mystical experiences. We need to make room to allow people to own their mystical experiences. Stop judging it. Stop criticizing it. Stop creating doubt for people. Because I've had my own mystical experiences in my international travel. And what happened to me is, is that's what's written in my first book, Awakening of a Chocolate Mystic. And it allowed me to, be, to, to almost reclaim parts of myself stuck from other lifetimes. I had my head chopped off in Peru. Uh, I, I was running in, in Egypt, you know, with the pharaohs. I mean, I had all kinds of crazy mystical experiences, but all of them had the same tenet. I was always part of the spiritual movements of the times. Mm -hmm. And now I'm being told, I now you need to be one of the leaders of the new movement of the time, which is allowing people to basically shed all of what they've created and just be who they are because that spiritual essence is who they were created to be. Absolutely. And what's what I find so amazing is that in that process, there for us, for me personally, in, in my early days, that mystical experience I had that first got a reflection of yeah, you've had a spiritual awakening. Why so young? Not quite sure. Most people don't go through it till mid-40s. And my advice to you is keep your mouth shut. Well, the following year, I hadn't kept my mouth shut. And I was institutionalized. And I told the same information to the psychiatrist in the hospital and got labeled. Complete opposite of what I'd experienced from someone who had an inkling of what I was going through. From a clinical perspective, the book-driven DSM-4, I think it was at the time, that was just there to label others that weren't understood, right? There was no time, no effort, no questions, nothing to explore. Well, what's really going on here? Let's talk about this. Mm -hmm. What happened was there were labels that were slapped on and there were drugs that were administered as a result. Well, those drugs for me should have had me a lump in the corners, 2,000 micrograms of Thorazine a day. Mm. Did it? No. I was up playing ping pong, beating the male nurses, and they couldn't figure me out. Well, maybe it's because what you're trying to treat me for, I don't have. There was never that consideration. Only when I finally told the doc what he wanted to hear did he tell my parents, oh, miracle cure, he's finally coming out of it. Yeah. That's such, pardon the, fra the phrase, bullshit, mm. right? Why do we do that to each other? Why do we take such pompous, arrogant stances and believe that we're an expert when it's proven that we're not? Yeah. Uh, I, my voice people. just raised. I, I'm really passionate about that because well, we need there are so many people who have that similar experience that have held it back for right. fear of being deemed crazy or put in a hospital or worse. Right, right. Which is why we're having these discussions. Own all of what is happening to you. And if you're not getting the right uh, response from people, then move on and continue to share your story with those that you feel understand. Never give up, part of, never give in. Part of that is the is spiritual awakening. You don't have a choice but to keep moving through. We all have <laughs> now to that's a funny one, isn't it? Yeah. That's, we, we all we made the choice. Yeah. We don't have any other choices. We don't have a, hey, you can't turn around and go back. You can't, mm -hmm. you can't, can't be put the unaware. Toothpaste of what, back in the tube for sure. Right. No toothpaste back in the tubes. No, no being unaware of what you're aware of. <laughs> so true. our job is to just support people moving through that just let people know i get it you know you're 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 not that crazy don't listen to that just keep analyzing and keep 
feeling what's happening. Because as we come through these things, we're like releasing this outer skin. We're, we're kind of like a snake shedding or the onion peeling. And all of this, as it comes off of us, allows for the emergence of the essence of who we really are, but in a physical body. Now, this is really cool. Mm -hmm. You can still, it's almost like dying, but you're still here. That's what right. I feel like most days. I feel like I've died, but yet I'm still in the body because I can still sense and feel and touch things, but it's more from an observer perspective. I'm not as um, reactionary to everything, but it's so cool. I can still smell the grass cut or the rain's coming and I can still touch things, but I have an appreciation for that now, whereas I didn't before because I realized I, I don't have to have access to the physical where I can still engage with the physical. Mm -hmm. Now, what about this fear of death, right? <laughs> this is one of the things that I overcame when I was asked if I was willing to die for what I believed in, right? And then as I entered the light, I was analyzing what was going on. Didn't realize it until I realized I was thinking, right? But as I was analyzing it, I felt a high-pitched, iridescent, effervescent sensation. I felt that back in my body when the entire process was done. So I realized that from that perspective, consciousness wise, being able to think there's no death. Mm -hmm. Now, how do we translate that understanding into a population that is literally scared to death? Of death. <laughs> right. Okay. Well, the first thing I'd say, Zen, is. You, me, and most people on this planet have had someone that they loved die, right? Mm -hmm. And from that experience, there, is be there has been some kind of mystical experience that you're not sharing with anybody. The person has come back and talked to you in a dream. You have had- Shown up in front of you. Right, shown up in front of you, told you where to find stuff in the house. I mean, we've all had it, but we have been conditioned to not believe it. I'm saying, believe it. It's so, your experience. How could you not believe it? Exactly. So if you believe it, then that can help mitigate your fears that once you leave the physical body, you're done for good. Now that is enough to scare anybody. If I leave my physical body, that's all there is. Well, that's if that's not all there is, then that releases some of that pressure. So now for me, the first time I was really, really aware that there is another dimension and what it feels like in this next dimension was when my mother's only sister died. I was not even that close to her. But in the middle of the night, I found myself full of energy and I was awakened and then I stood up on the bed and I was jumping up and down on the bed. I'm like in my, I don't know, late thirties, jumping up and down on the bed, hollering and screaming. Oh my God, I feel so good. Bounce it like, like the kids do. You, you fall back on the bed, you jump it up. He like a is little children, right? I felt so good. And then I finally could calm down after a couple of hours of feeling like this and went to sleep. So the next morning around 7.30, my mother knocks on my door, no, calls me on the phone and she says, my sister died. I said, oh, you know, I had a crazy experience last night around 3.30 in the morning. And I start describing this and my mother says, hold on, tell her daughter what you're telling me. I'm like, well, okay. Well, yeah, 3.30 in the morning, I was jumping up and down. I felt so good. It's so amazing. I said, so what time did your mom die? 3.30 in the morning. If that is what it feels like to die, hey, take me now. Right. It's an amazing physical feeling. Now, I've had other experiences where I have talked to people who have died. I had, I had a recent one where I saw myself pushing back. It looked like a curtain, like on a stage, and mm -hmm. giving a person a hug. And when I woke up the next day, I'm like, oh, my who God. Who is that man behind the curtain? Yeah, I, I said, right. oh, my God. Or, or no, I think it's pay no attention to that. <laughs> no, I, 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 I knew it was. It was my friend, my girlfriend. I hadn't talked to her in, in quite a few years. I gave her a hug. And when I woke up the next morning, I said, oh, my God, she's dead. And I looked it up. And she actually had died several years before. Hmm. So we all have it. 
It's about owning it, acknowledging it, knowing that it's real for us. It's how we get our own information. And so allow it to move you even without trying to move everybody into your belief. Right. The problem we have is we want everybody to believe what we believe. Oh my God, I had this experience. Let me tell you about it. And don't you believe that? No. Oh my, so my experience is not real because you don't believe it. We've got to trust. Your experience what, isn't for another. It's for you. It's none of your business what others think of your experience. But, but the, your experience. The conditioning, Zen, the conditioning says we need external validation. I know. Oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> so how do we get that how so we don't need it is there a share well I, I wonder because there is that inkling of needing it that maybe at some level there's a shared experience that can happen that expands that awareness into the we are not mm -hmm. just the i am Okay, it, it, to me, I think it expands as each of us individually ignores the people that say it's not real. Right. So, so individually, we're connecting to each other, expanding the possibilities that these mystical experiences have reality. Okay. And as more of us own that and expand that level of consciousness, others can fall in. You know, we, we only need a critical mass. We only need about 10% of us. But, but to do in that, that in that critical mass, right? Yeah. What's the shared experience there? And the that reason I'm asking that, that is because in this concept of harmony, the Vedantic philosophy, you know, unity of consciousness, divine threads, all in, in the tapestry, working together, then it would seem that these mystical experiences would all coalesce in a unified field somehow that is reflective to the individual and the group gathered for whatever purpose and function in the world. I, I agree with that, but keep in mind what I said early, we're all different puzzle pieces. Mm -hmm. So all of the pieces are coming in from different directions. To so this field. Right. I, I get they, that. That's the individuation in. of right. each of us. Right. Then, as in the oneness, right, that we both know to exist, how does that operate? Where does it show up? What kind of experiences lead us to each other, like you and I have? And how do we then move it up to a new level, like with Live and Let Live? where we address it on a global scale of removing aggression and supporting being an excellent human. <laughs> All right, Zen, you're probably going to laugh at me, but that's above my pay grade, ah! above yours. Therein lies the Is problem. It? We're Is it trying really? To I think that's, uh, we're to me, to that's we're a limiting belief. Yeah, it's a limiting belief. We're trying to make it happen as opposed to becoming the clear channels to allow it to emerge. Well, there's, therein is the point. Are we really trying? Are we still pushing and pulling energy to try to make it happen? Or are we in that place of presence where we access, feel, and operate in flow? Well, to me, we're, when we put out a cause, and the cause is, this is what I want to see happen. I want to see harmony. I want to see balance. I want to see oneness. I want to see that. That's putting out a cause. How about if we withdraw that? I'm free to be. I just want to help other people clear the channels. I don't know what's going to happen. Mm -hmm. how, about we, how about we can live in that? I, I feel good. I feel good in the connectivity when I withdraw my causes. And I'm having better flow when I withdraw my causes. And if this is what harmony feels like, I love this. But I can't really label it. And I don't really know where it's going. All I know is that. I am stepping back more and more from controlling the body, controlling the outer of what I think needs to happen. And the more I'm doing that, the more the presence within me is filling that space. And I'm just like, so that presence within you, the, what is it all connected to and how does it work in harmony within itself? This above is my pay grade. Layer. Above my pay grade. How <laughs> does space operate 
inside of the, the, the subatomic particles, how does space operate? Who knows how space operates? Who knows between the proton, neutron, and electron? How does space operate? Well, I had some space, questions about space, that. And, and not that it was above my pay grade, but I had questions uh, specifically about seeing the Trinity ubiquitous, right? Yeah. So where'd that come from? In one of my experiences, I was taken to a three sun solar system with a dozen planets around these three suns. The suns were exponentially larger. And what was reflected, and I heard a voice, several as one, say, we are not only your forefathers, we are also the forefathers of your solar system. Mm -hmm. So I began to ask questions. My guide says, nope, that's it. You got all you need. You'll figure it out. Yeah. So on the way back, I'm asking questions, and I'm figuring this stuff in my mind, and I'm thinking, okay, macro, trinity, micro, where does this show up? Oh, proton, electron, and neutron. Hmm, interesting. The consciousness is in the pit, the space between those energy, you know, quantum physics. or whatever you want to call them. And that's what manages how this physical world is constructed and our engagement in it when we acquiesce to the flow of it. Mm -hmm. So one thing was still not present, and that's the hydrogen atom. Mm -hmm. And so I started questioning it, and I was like, okay. What, what's up with this? Because it's only got two that's missing a third. Well, where is it? Most prevalent gas in the universe powers our sun. And oh, by the way, it is the bonding agent for our DNA. Helix. So that kind of really brought some further deeper questions and, and at least some understanding that, yes, there is a construct. There is a form, fit, and function for this all that when we release to it, others are drawn to us for that next level experience. And I'm I'm sure in, you've in experienced total. that in your work. Right. Even I'm, though, I, and I, I get, I'm, I'm reluctant to take responsibility for that too, but my pay grade, however, it doesn't have to be. We're still the servants in that energy right. and so to me to me to me Zen, our job is to keep expanding our consciousness to allow for the new concepts to come in mm -hmm. you can't do what you Correct. don't understand you can't live exactly. what you know. so our job is to keep so as you're expanding your consciousness through your experiences and i'm expanding mine that continues to allow for new information but for me to decide where it needs to go and how to use it that's not my decision. That's intellectual. That's, that's an intellectual. Flow. Yeah. And that's going right. to be limiting if it's because it has to come through my brain, which has a certain limited exposure right now. Is it a brain thing or is it a feeling thing? Like I said before, it's hard to think our way through a system built on very vibration. We, it seems that we need to sense our way through that, which is there what is, the energy flow is. We don't yeah, intellectualize But we won't it. do that because we won't allow our hearts to lead because our hearts are full of crap. <laughs> it, the ideal flow yeah. would be to allow your allow the spirit to guide your heart and your and your heart to lead your brain and your brain to execute that's mm -hmm. how, that's the ideal flow and and then your brain can execute all of what's being said be, all of what it's feeling all of what it's being directed to do because it has the capacity to do all of that synthesis analysis you know right to be able to execute something now we're talking about human consciousness mm -hmm. um one of my books called zero to one making our way toward a conscious civilization i <laughs> think that there's a uh a, at least a subtle difference between human and non-human intelligence because there's other beings out there that have been down this road before us <laughs> that we may not realize that are accessible and not just accessible, they're ready, willing, and able, and often interjecting things in our lives that we're unaware of in order to help us move down that path. Would you, or have you had a sense of that or an experience of that level, kind of like what you did with the past life things that you experienced, yeah. and yet more towards of, here's what's coming. Here's, oh, you know, some bread no, I can't say that's been mine. Mine have been the mystical on the past life, running with all the major masters 
you know, from Jesus to Buddha to, you know, Lezu and all. I mean, that's been mine. It's, I have not had that. As much as I have at times seen things in the sky going, oh my God, what is that? And like, does anybody else see that? <laughs> right, so right. Knowing that. Well, these are the kinds of things like you were talking about earlier, people are afraid to share. There's a whole group of folks in the ufology field that have that experience and are afraid to share because every time they do, they're dismissed, you know, dejected, rejected, persecuted, right. uh, shunned you know, all of these kinds of things, because it just sounds too unbelievable. Okay, so Zen, you're bringing up another point. We have to encourage people and support people to be courageous. Mm. Now is the time to be courageous. Courageous by owning and accepting your own experiences. Because you're on the leading edge of expanding the consciousness. And if you don't own yours, then it doesn't keep us expanding. Right. But it takes courage to own yours. Now, I've heard that courage is fear that said its prayers. Say that again. Courage is fear that's said its prayers. Courage is fear that said its prayers. Well said. I can't claim it. It came from a movie that my wife and I were watching. And I was like, oh, that's so perfect. But that's what needs to happen now. There's so many things that are quote unquote unexplainable. Mm -hmm. But we need to own what we feel is true and right for ourselves. Now, do you I find own... that the, this unexplainable, the, the first thing we try to do, not necessarily the first thing we try to do, um, well, yeah. Possibly we, we try to define it. And yet the first thing that happens is that we pull back because we're a bit threatened by it, if not fearful of it, because it is unknown. Because why we have not been conditioned to place it anywhere in our brain. It doesn't have a box up there. Mm. And anything that doesn't have a box, we're fearful, we're, we reject, we, we resist. And what I'm saying is we've got to open up. If it doesn't have a box, create one. Well, maybe we, we need that we, uh, we, maybe we need another platonic solid. Yeah. To work with, right. Right. Create a box. So, okay, I got a new box. I had to create a new box for mystical experiences. I'm waking up to some guy talking to me, and he, I mean, the most beautiful eyes, and he looked, and if the whole thing felt real, looked real, and then I wake up and he's a real person. I have no frame of reference in my brain for that. Mm -hmm. except I call my Catholic cousin. She says, go to the Catholic bookstore, get a bunch of books on the guy. I did understood all of his philosophy, but more than that, I understood his life and why certain things happened to him. And I'm reading the book on, that's not true. That's not why he did that. That's what do you mean? I don't even yeah, know right. this guy. But, but by the time I go to a CC for real, I'm like, oh yeah, I really know this guy. And I, not only do I know this guy, but I used to live here because I was moving around the city without no, without a map, knowing where the streets connected. Mm -hmm. You you have to own that within yourself. You got to create your own box. So by the time I'm doing that in the CC, by the time I get to Egypt, and the guide says, "Do you believe in past lives?" And I'm like, "Ah, oh, yeah, I guess now." Well, good because you're from here too. Right. So we come over the Nile, off the Nile at the Luxor, the Temple of Luxor, and I turned to my mother and I said, where's the rest of the temple? She said, what are you talking about? I said, this, this is not all of it. Well, the next day we go to the Temple of Karnak and the guy says, the temple you saw yesterday at Luxor and the temple you see today at Karnak, they were one temple, the temple at Thebes, and they were connected by a two-mile walkway. Now, how do I know that? in my current life, not having been to Egypt before. Mm -hmm. And what I'm saying is we've got to open up. We got to create new boxes up there mm -hmm. to allow for the storage of this new information so we can keep expanding individually and collectively. And realize there's help. You know, the thing about boxes is they have labels on the outside. Yes. And yes. those that are outside the box can read those labels so they know how to deal with what's inside of the box. And if you've got some boxes, at least other people know, oh, yeah, they've got boxes. So I'm not the only one with these kind of boxes. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Courage. Courage. <laughs> we all need it. We do. And as we 
example that courage as we step into those fears those doors just get blown open and once we're through the door realize oh that's kind of silly it, right right it's like i can't believe i used to live like that i say that to myself all the time i can't believe i used to can't believe i used to be upset about that can't believe believe i and used yet to be these processes these patterns these belief systems are so deeply embedded through bloodlines cultural means Edgy. all of these things that have happened throughout history in our planetary civilization development all of these things are still present in the thoughtmosphere that we all are part of absolutely now how do you find is a way to kind of see that and yet refocus in the present to do in the moment what's necessary it's back to what you said we we are feeling creatures and if you're feeling something and you let your heart decide you let the spirit within you let that intuitive self lead it then that will force a break in some of that conditioning it will just force a break in it because you either it, don't acknowledge what you're really feeling to hold on to your conditioning. Oh, that's not right. I shouldn't do that. I shouldn't say that. I shouldn't agree. Or you feel what you're feeling and you say, I'm not doing it. I don't care. Be mad. Be angry. Uh, say whatever. That's the freedom. So follow that side of yourself. And where there's a conflict, continue to, to put yourself first, which is what we're told not to do. We're told to do it superficially, but if you really do it, don't do it when it affects me. <laughs> so that brings in the concept of self-love. What's that all about? Yeah. To me, to me, self-love is just that authentic, intuitive side of yourself. You make that a priority over what everybody else is saying, doing, and feeling. Because there's a reason why you're getting certain information for yourself and somebody else may be getting something else. And what we have a tendency, especially women, is to yield to the somebody else. And that builds resentment. It, slowly, surely, it builds resentment. And ultimately, somebody's gonna ask you to do something that's totally innocuous, and you're gonna blow a stack. You're gonna lose it. And it has nothing to do with that. It has everything to do with suppressing how you truly feel. And there are ways of expressing it. How do we grow in that way of expressing, acknowledging our boundaries, our inner feelings, what we're experiencing in the moment? How do we share that effectively with another individual or in a group? How have you found that to be? I'm shaking my head and, and smiling because my way of doing that was not very effective. I was always trying to understand and trying to mitigate and try to minimize and try to. And one day I just. That almost sounds like a Cancerian trait. I just. Are you a water sign by chance? No, I'm a Gemini. So oh, I lost okay. it. So, so <laughs> what I found, what I found in myself and maybe other people on the spiritual path have this problem. We have a tendency to resist conflict. Mm -hmm. My sister would always tell me, conflict creates progress. Conflict creates progress. And I say, no, all we got to do is understand one another. All we got to do is make room for one another. All we got to do is allow. Mm -hmm. No, mm -hmm. you got to <laughs> understand. So what I started doing was allowing myself to engage in the conflict. I have never experienced such freedom. I, it's not that I would initiate the conflict. It's just that I would allow myself to respond whatever way that came. Yeah. All that analysis I would do later. Now, why was I that upset about that? And what did they say? And what was my belief? And what was my expectation? But in that moment, none of that went on. I allowed myself to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with whomever was saying whatever. And in that was the release of that bottled-up emotion that I was unwilling to express. 
is this the process of establishing harmony? And the reason I ask that is that we often think that chaos, conflict, all of these things are resistant to harmony, when in fact, they're the keys to it. It's the patterns, the processes, the belief systems, the habits, the behaviors that we work through that create the harmony, the acceptance of them so that there's effective management of them in a global or, or in a larger perspective. That's, that's well said. That's why I said oneness is the acceptance of the differences. Mm -hmm. When you can allow yourself to move through the conflict and then now you have different kinds of borders. I like borders rather than boundaries. Borders, you can open the door and let somebody in and out. Boundaries, that's just it. That's, that, you know. Right. So as we, as we all move through that, and I, that's why for me, every day I watch the news in America, I'm grateful for the chaos and I'm grateful for the conflict. Because to me, everybody e is going through this. And as a society, we're going through it, where we're coming at each other with everything that we have. And once that energy is released, you never have that level of energy again. Mm -mm. There's yeah, nothing that brings can... up the awareness that this just doesn't feel right. Not only that, but I can't get my way doing it like this because the other person is equally strong. Yeah. And as we're bringing this clashing energy and everybody's equally strong, we have to have a different way to communicate after that. Right. And because I'm not point. agreeing. Everybody is equally as strong. Everybody. And so you can't, you can't get what you want by limiting somebody else, mm -hmm. not a recipe for sustainability. Goes back to my comment about the shared experience, right? You've got to acquiesce to that possibility, first of all, and then be willing to step in and navigate the chaos, ask the questions, you know, yes, understanding can happen through it because that's part of what happens as you get to know another by asking them questions about why they're in conflict yeah but you know what's interesting as you as you really um unload a lot of this energy from within you and your belief systems start to alter and you make allowances for everybody there are very few situations that can pull you back in the same way mm -hmm. so you're no if you're not in conflict with yourself it's almost impossible to be in conflict with other people because you, you see what they're doing. You see their limitations and you're more likely to adjust and accommodate. <laughs> That's where I am. Well, now. I'm, I'm laughing I'm because happy, my show then. opening, right? I totally agree with you in my show opening. Namaste and in la catch. Namaste means I, the divine in me recognizes the divine, divine in you. In, you right? in la catch is a Mayan phrase that means I am another you. Right. So what, you know, when but you're you, in your place, others can be in their place too. Yeah. But you know what also happens as you continue to unload all of this and your, your belief systems expand, there is nothing, I'll speak for myself personally, there is nothing that I decide to do that will cause harm to another individual. And I'm willing to do it anyway, because right. Making you, making you uh, experience pain or suffering doesn't bring me joy because of the connectivity now. So what I'm, what I'm more likely to do is how can I uh, do what I'm doing with and accommodate you too if, you're on, if, if what I'm doing is going to have a real adverse impact on you? That's and the person right. may say, nothing, this is how it's going to be. And then I'll say, well, okay but I've got to make this happen. So I'm giving you advance notice so you can make adjustments because this is how I'm going to do it. Mm -hmm. So that's something different than I don't care about you. And I don't care about how I'm being and how that impacts you. When you get this new awareness, there's no decision that you make where you consciously want to hurt another individual or you don't care about the impact. So your decisions are optimized and maximized for those that have that are going to be impacted by your decision, but not only that, it's coming out of the infinite invisible. The decision, the solution is coming from a place you don't even understand. And as a result, those variables are already being considered. Mm -hmm. So when you make a decision and it's coming through for execution in the brain, when it's coming through for execution, it may look in that moment like 
it is the worst decision ever. And you will find out later why it was executed like that. And it actually benefits everybody because it moves everybody who needs to be moved. And the ultimate long-term impact of that is harmony beyond a way you could have ever imagined. Mm -hmm. And I'm living that now in my own house with my own family, with my own relatives, with my own friendships, with some of my clients, we're all going through things like that to open up that space. So as we continue to allow for whatever this intuitive, divine, mystical, whatever this is that comes in and out and through us, it's making decisions that benefit the whole. And all of us are, are part of the whole. We, we're, for me, it's all about, well, what about me? What about me? That's always been me. What about me? Well, one day I was told, you are part of the whole. So if the decision benefits the whole, it will also benefit you. Precisely. Okay. We're, oh gosh, this has just been an amazing conversation. I so enjoyed it. And it was so imbued with a sense of harmony in it. On a parting note, because we're about out of time, what kind of advice would you give to a person who's just beginning to dip their toe into their inner self and awareness? Trust what you're getting. Trust what you're getting. Don't doubt yourself. Don't share your story with others that create doubt in you. Trust what you're getting and allow that to change your fundamental beliefs because that's what the mystical, magical experiences are doing. They're changing that conditioning. They're breaking through some of that conditioning. Allow it to happen because in that is freedom. Very well said. And thank you so much for your time, energy, insight, wisdom, and sharing of that with me and our audience. It's been my pleasure. We're one world moving in a new direction. That we are. And namaste and in la catch. And thank you for sticking with us with, for this episode of One World in a New World. I'm Zen Benefiel, your host, and I will see you next time. <laughs>